So here you are, essentially a career criminal by your early 20s. And then in 1962, you're 24 years old, and you end up killing William McCarthy and James Maraglia. You got, you're misstated that. I was involved. I stole with these guys. I was stole with them. It was either I give up Billy McCarthy. If I didn't, then I would get killed. So I had to make a choice between my life and his life. You got to choose your own life to live, right? Now, if you care to hear that story, I could tell you. Let's hear it. We were burglars together, these two guys and myself. Likeable guys, but very dangerous. Uh, Billy, we called the goat. That was his nickname. Jimmy, we called lover boy. So you know he was a handsome guy. Billy, he was Irish. And when he drank, Irishmen can't hold their liquor. That's what we were, we were always told. And it appeared that way with Billy. He'd always get in the fight when he was drunk. He was married. He had a couple kids. Jimmy was married, too. Billy went into a lounge on Manine Road that was managed by two brothers. Philly and Ronnie Scavo. The place was owned by a guy named by the name of Frank Pondaleo, owned a construction company. The property was owned by Paul Rica. Paul Rica. So Frank Pondaleo, true marriage, was connected to one of these outfit guys. So he was able to get the lease on the property, Paul Rica's property. And at that time, Manine Road is where they had all the nightclubs. So these two brothers managed to join for Frank Pondaleo. Now they know Billy. They know him. Because we're all from Grand and Ogden, actually. So Billy went in there several times, and one night he goes in there and he's drunk. So he gets in an argument with Ronnie. So they throw him out of the place. He didn't like that. He had a lot of pride. He comes back, he complains to me, telling me about it. I tell him, Billy, you were drunk, forget about it. There's a no win over there. And uh, I'm gonna, yeah, he's going on. And I said, forget it. He tries it again a week later. They beat him up and throw him out again. Now he comes back. He says, I'm gonna kill him. You coming with me? I said, Billy, think about it. And I told him what could possibly happen. I said, he said, they'll never know. Nobody will never know we've done it. I said, give it a break. Let it relax. Don't go there no more. Next time he goes back with Billy, I mean with Jimmy, they both get the shit kicked out of him, thrown out of her. They come back to me. Are you going to come or not? I said, yeah, I'll go with you. We can't even breathe a word about this. We went out there three or four times. I'm not quite sure. But every time we went there, we went there with a work car and guns. A work car is a car that's fictitiously owned, plated, and so on. I live close to the Black Dora, my house. So to kill him, if we kill him there, it was easy to get to my house, stash the car, and get out of that area before, you know, anything. So every time we went there, they left with a girl. And I said, I ain't killing no woman. I said, she's got nothing to do with this. So Billy said, she's a waitress in the giant. I said, what do you want? To, what do you, want? You, you can't kill her. What's the matter with you? So on the third time, I said, I'm not going to keep on coming here if this woman keeps on coming on. Okay, okay, we understand. Now, this particular night, the fourth time, I believe, I was in a bowling alley called High Top because we used to bowl like anybody else. And I'm with her with, with this girl. Her name was Debbie. First time I got her, I was going to get lucky. And I said, ah, I'm going to get lucky with her finally. She just got married. She was going to cheat. So here comes Billy in the bowling alley. He knew where I would be. He's got a hoodie on. And I tell her, have a seat, I'll be right back. I walk up to him, I says, what's up? He says, Jimmy and I are ready to go. Are you ready to go? I said, Billy, I'm with this Aubrey. I call her Aubrey. I'm with this Aubrey over here. I'm going to get lucky tonight. Can you wait till tomorrow or the next day? Oh, where's the guns? I said, they're in my garage. You know how to get in there which was close to the Black Door Lounge. 
And he said, all right, we're going to give it a shot. I said, remember, if there's a girl there, don't do nothing. Well, they left. They got their work car. They got their guns. Me and the girl leave. We stop at a gas station on Man Eye Road. I hear boom, 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 boom. That ain't gunshots. I hear a car, high-powered engine. I'm standing outside putting gas in her tramp convertible. I look over. There's the work car. Oh, they're gone. We go to a motel. We get up around 8.30 in the morning. She got to get home before her husband comes to the late shift. We're driving in the car, and I hear it on the radio. Two men and a female, machine gunned to death in Elmwood Park. I go, Elmwood Park? It's got to be them. I'm thinking to myself. And they just left it at that. So then he, he, he's on the news all day long. Now, Elmwood Park was controlled. Paul Rica lived there. Jack Cerrone lived there. All the wise guys lived there. It was controlled that town by the outfit. The last thing you want to do is cause murder. All that confusion in that little town draws heat. Then you want to kill the two brothers that their father was connected to Tony Arcardo and Paul Rica. Man, you caused a lot of problems. I'm thinking, holy Christ. Now I'm saying, thank God I wasn't there. Now I'd be known to me that Tony knew I was stealing with these two guys. And he knew that they were having problems with the Scavo brothers. And don't take a genius to figure it out. So I figured out, well, I didn't do nothing. No one's going to bother me. I get a call from Tony. All landlines. There's no such thing as pay, you know, cell phone. He's going to be home for a while. I said, yeah. He said, I'm with Dickie, Gorman, Richie. He said, I'll be right over. I owned a home in Franklin Park. He comes over. We go down into the basement. Richard sits up in the kitchen. Upstairs. He said, Frankie, they're going to kill you. I said, who's going to kill me? He's the outfit. They think you were with Jimmy and Billy. I said, what are you talking about? I'm acting dumb. He said, you know what I'm talking about. You were part of him when you killed, when you killed the Scava brothers and that girl. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. This went on for about a half hour, not even a half hour. And he said, listen, I pulled you out from underneath this. I convinced him that you weren't there. Now, I'm going to go back and tell him that you don't want to set up Billy. We know, we know, I don't know who the third guy was. We know there was a third guy. He said, you're going to tell me or not? Because I'm going to leave. It's like, like I told you about a half hour. I said, all right, Tony. I said, I'll tell you. I said, there was nobody there except them two guys. Are you know that for a fact? And I told him about the gas station, pumping gas to see in the car. Uh, he said, uh, okay. I said, am I all right? No. He says, yeah, you're right. Don't do nothing. Stick around your house. Well, immediately, immediately I went outside, and I uh, built a stash in my car where I could hide a gun in case I got pulled over. The cops wouldn't know it was there. And th then I called an electrician over. And I put sensors where if I drove within 25 feet of my driveway, my house would light up like it was Wrigley Field, the ballpark. All lights would go on. Because I didn't trust them. I wanted to make sure I had enough lighting. Because the way my house was, if you pull in my drive, my garage, you could pull in it and drive out of it. I had double overhead doors. That's the way I made it for that particular reason. It's my own safety. Because I still didn't trust what Tony was said he could do for me. He calls me later on. He said, meet me at the tip-top bowling alley. That's Sam Bowling Alley. I met him. He said, let's go across the street. He said, I want you to call Billy up. Tell him to meet you tonight in Morrow's Park at the chicken house at 8 o'clock. He said, I'm going to be standing right next to him. I call him on a pay phone. Billy's wife answers, Betty. She knows my voice. You can tell I got a voice that stands up. Frankie, how are you? Is Billy there, Betty? She said, yeah. He's in the living room. He comes to the phone. He says, what's up? He's acting like nothing ever happened. I said, I got something really good. Now, at this time, they didn't have no wire taps. They had the pin where they could know what number's going to. I said, could you meet me at 8 o'clock at the chicken house? 
Melrose Bar. He said, I don't have a car. He said, I got to get my father-in-law's car. My car broke down last night. I says, all right. I'll, I'll, he says, so if you don't see my car, I'll be in my father-in-law's car. I said, I'll see you at eight. I get off the tone and tone. He said, good job. I said, but she knows I call him. He says, don't worry. They, they don't say nothing. He said, the wife's always just, they go in a shell. I said, all right. He said, meet me at 730 at the Howard Johnson on North Avenue. It's right before Melrose Park. Come with your work car. I had a Ford work car. I drove in the lot. I see a, another Ford, a little newer. I pull in, Tony jumps out of the car. There was another guy in the car with Tony. Tony comes over and he says, give me the keys. He brings me over to the car. He says, Saint, the guy's name, we call him Saint. His name was Vincent and, and, and Cyril. He worked directly for Joey Ayupa, the boss, one of the bosses, big boss. He says, sit with him until I get back. I get in the car. I sit in the car. Hello, how you doing? Bro? Saint hits a button. The dashboard, they had the speakers in the dash. It pops up. He reaches in and grabs a 38 stub. I immediately reach him back to me because I had a, I had a pistol on me. I wasn't going on that meeting with a gun. And I pulled the gun on. I put it on my side. He said, what are you doing? I said, same fucking thing you're doing. I said, I'm protecting myself. He said, I just got this in case the cops roll up on us. He says, you know, if they get stony. I said, well, then you got two guns now. I said, well, I'm sitting there like that. Sat there about, I don't know, half hour. Seemed like forever. Then my car pulls up. Tony gets out of the car. He says to me, it went easy. He says, I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'll tell you what happened. He gets in the car with Saint. I get in my car. We go our different ways. Two days later, three days later, Tony, I meet him. Then he tells him, we we're going to talk about this one time. And we'll never talk about it again. He says, I went to the chicken house. He said, your car, I parked your car in front. I went inside. I seen Billy pull up in front. When he pulled up in front, I walked outside. Billy said, hey, Tony, how you doing? Tony says, all right, Billy. He said, what are you doing here? He said, I thought Frankie was there. His car's there. Tony says, yeah, he's not there. Billy says, well, I'm supposed to meet him. So Billy says, well, if he's not there, I better leave. So Billy starts to turn around. Tony grabs him around the neck. He knew he had a gun on him. Pulls the gun off from him. Sticks it in his ribs. Pulls him to the car that was there. And in the car was Joe Ferriola, James Tortorella, and Chucky Nicoletti. They throw Tony in the, they throw Billy in the car. They're beating him up in the car. They bring him to Cicero. This is Tony telling me this. They get him to Cicero. They bring him, they bring him in the basement. In the basement, Milwaukee Phil's there, Alarigio. They bring him in the basement, and they proceed to beat him. Torture him. They use ice picks on him. They did everything imaginable to make him talk. They wanted him to talk to tell him who the third guy was. He refused to tell him because there was none. So finally, what's his name? Stick his head in the vice. Let's see if he talks now. Tony said, I jammed his head in the vice. Not like in the movie Casino. Downward. He said, we spun the vice. The vice only goes so far. So we had to jam his head in there. Squeeze the vice. He said, I never expected this to happen. His eyeballs popped out. He said, they hang on a, a cord. I never paid attention to that shit. And I went back, he said. Now, Frank, he said, we did ice picks in his testicles. We tortured this guy. He said, finally, the guy said, I'm telling you, there was nobody with me but Billy. Please kill me. He said, that's when I proceeded to cut his throat. He said, now we had to get Billy, Jimmy. Without Billy, without Jimmy knowing Billy disappeared or Billy was dead. So that means we had to keep him on ice until we got Jimmy. He said, that was one tough Irishman, Frankie. He said, now we'll never talk about this again. And if you run into Billy, 
Jimmy, I keep on saying Jimmy, Jimmy, if you run into Jimmy within this period of time before we get him, do not talk about Billy. If he asks you, say, I haven't seen him. Would you believe the following night I ran at the Jimmy at the Colonial House restaurant on Harlem and Grand? I walk in there and Jimmy's cheating. He's with a broad. He just got married, this guy. So, hey, Frank, what's going on? I remember we were crooks together. And he says, hey, so I've been looking for Billy for a few days. His wife said the last person he talked to was you. Uh, no, I said, oh, Jesus. I said, yeah. I said, we talked for a few minutes. He never showed up the night I was supposed to meet him. And he said, I wanted to tell him so bad, but I knew if I did, and they found out, then I'm number three. That's going to die. So I said, I didn't. I never showed up. I just left. I said, I figured maybe he couldn't get the car. He, he said he was coming with his father-in-law's car or something. And uh, Jimmy said, ah, you know how to be Irishman to get. He's probably drunk somewhere. Or would have cheated on a bro, would have brought. They get Jimmy. Now Jimmy's antennas went up. So he goes and meets a, a boss. A guy made guy. He was not, he was a boss of his own crew. The guy uh, had a lounge in Niles, Illinois. And he goes in there and he tells the guys, listen, I got I know I got a problem. You got to help me out. And the guy said, all right. He says, let me get a hold of the bosses and I'll contact you in a couple of days. So that night, Jimmy decides to go drinking. This is all documented, anything I'm telling you. To a lounge in Chicago. And he goes in there. Not be known to him that there's three guys in a work car parked outside down the street because they were looking for him to show up somewhere. They were armed. They had stashes in the car with guns, rifles, everything you think of. They knew Jimmy was in there. This is a different lounge. But the cops seen three men hiding in the car. So they arrested these guys in the car. It was uh, Milwaukee Phil Olorizio. It was uh, Chuck, Chucky Nicoletti, and it was another guy. I can't think of his name. Now. Anyway, it's all documented. They arrested the three guys, find all the guns. But they don't know why they were at this tavern. They beat the case, mind you, with all these guns in there. That's like nice and legitimate. Our police department was then. Then they get the call from Niles. The guy says, I'm going to have him meet me here tomorrow night. So they went there. And... Uh, the following night, and they got Jimmy. And they took him in the back room at a, a, a tavern, and they Jimmy started fighting him. And within this fight, they broke his voice box by punching him in the vo vocal cords. And then they uh, they figured they knocked him out, and they went out, and they decided how they were going to do it. So Saint shows up. And this, this is stuff that's told to me now. And he's got the car that's going to transport Jimmy's body in it. So he shows up. They get Jimmy and they put him in the trunk. Tony's there. Saint's there. I don't know. He mentioned the other guy's names. I forgot. They put Jimmy in the trunk. Uh, they tied him. Now they got a follow-up car. Saint's driving the car with Jimmy in the trunk. Tony's in the car and back with whoever he's with. They got walkie-talkies, communication back and forth. Then they noticed the taillights go out in the car. This scene was stolen from me for Goodfellas. I want you to understand that. This scene was stolen from me, this actual event. So when you see Goodfellas, you see that scene where he jumps out of the trunk? They stole that. That's why they, they were so indebted to me, that movie, for doing other movies. So... Uh, Jimmy pops out of the trunk. He got himself untied. He pulled the brake lights. He jumps out and he starts running. They grab him. They bring him back to the trunk and they beat him up. And then he tells him, listen, I know you're going to kill him. He's, he can't hardly talk. His voice is gone because of the voice box. He says, please. So my wife collects on the insurance. Cut my throat. Don't strangle me in it. Well, they accommodate him. They cut his throat. They bring him to Jimmy, I mean to Billy. They put him together. 
in the same trunk, the car that Billy had, they parked them on the south side. Three or four days later, the stench of the bodies in the trunk show up because it started getting warmer. And they called, somebody called the police, they opened up the trunk, they found the two bodies in the trunk. And that's what happened. Right, and that was known as the m and murders. That was the m and murders, yes. I did testify in that. 